Ahead tonight on Soul of the South News, former Illinois Congressman Jesse Jackson Jr. asked for forgiveness before a federal judge sentences him for misspending campaign funds. Explosion, then fire engulfs a UPS cargo plane. Joining forces with the First Lady to encourage kids to hip hop to good health. And putting a design dream on the international runway. I went to New York with three models and three designs and gave it a shot and I made it through all the way to the end. Soul of the South News shines the spotlight on Kato Mamalu. This is Soul of the South News. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Soul of the South News. I'm Roy Hobbs, and topping your news tonight, there are doubts that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial in the nation's capital will be ready for the anniversary of his historic march on Washington. The Chinese sculptor removed a controversial quote on the monument, but preparing, repairing rather, where that quote is is causing a problem. Now, right now, the monument is covered with scaffolding around it. The Park Service believes it can get the repairs done in time for the anniversary at the end of this month. But if not, it will remove the scaffolding for the celebration and finish the work later. Both Martin Luther King and Medgar Evers were focused on ending segregation and advancing the civil rights movement. And like King, Evers' efforts were cut short. In our cover story tonight, Solo the South's Mary Major takes a look back at the day Evers was murdered and how his killer was finally brought to justice. Medgar Evers knew how to shake the conscience of white America. He was getting folks to the polls, marching against white companies that practiced segregation, integrating education. He was not the preacher on the front, but the worker doer getting his hands dirty in the field behind the scenes. But when he appeared at WLBT in Mississippi, white Mississippians now knew who he was, and that was threatening. Megger was at an NAACP meeting listening to President Kennedy make a breakthrough speech about blacks in America. Fires of frustration and discord are burning in every city, north and south, where legal remedies are not at hand. Redress is sought in the streets, in demonstrations, parades, and protests, which create tensions and threaten violence and threaten lives. We face, therefore, a moral crisis as a country and a people. We have a right to expect that the Negro community will be responsible, will uphold the law, but they have a right to expect that the law will be fair, that the Constitution will be colorblind, as Justice Harlan said at the turn of the century. This is what we're talking about, and this is a matter which concerns this country and what it stands for. And in meeting it, I ask the support of all of our citizens. Thank you very much. For Medgar, this was a victory speech. He arrived home that night celebratory. The movement was progressing. It was a little after midnight on June 12, 1963. Medgar Evers pulls his Oldsmobile into his driveway here at home. He gets out of the car and walks to the trunk where he has some promotional t-shirts that say, Jim Crow must go. Across the street, White supremacist Byron de la Beckwith is hiding in the bushes with a rifle. Medgar walks towards the house and the rifle is fired. De la Beckwith takes a shot. It enters his back through his chest and into the house. Merle Evers runs to the door to find her husband face down. An hour later, he is announced dead. Despite fingerprints and a rifle found in the bushes across the street from the Evers home, De La Beckwith was still white, and it was still the Old South. This is Hines County Court where Byron De La Beckwith was tried twice in 1964. Both trials ended in a hung jury and the case was dismissed. Well, with a lot of persistence from Murley Evers and newfound evidence, he was tried again in 1994 and this time he was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison, 31 years after the death of Medgar Evers. Jerry Mitchell with the Jackson Clarion Ledger broke the cold case with evidence that brought Byron De La Beckwith back to court for the third time. There was a agency in Mississippi, defunct agency, called the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission, 
and so it was a state segregation spy agency and all. The Mississippi legislature didn't want any of those records out. They sealed them all for 50 years and I knew there was something in there and I, so I said I'd get them. And when I got my hands on them, they showed at the same time the state of Mississippi was trying to prosecute Byron D. LeBeck with for killing Meg Revers, this other arm of the state, the Sovereignty Commission, which was headed by the governor, was secretly assisting in defense, trying to get Beckwith acquitted, and nobody knew that. So that story ran October 1st, 1989. After my story ran, Merle Evers asked for the case to be reopened. It was finally reopened, and, and um, he was reindicted re-prosecuted successful. And although Medgar the man is gone, his spirit is more present than ever. For Soul of the South, I'm Mary Major. A tearful Jesse Jackson Jr. appears before a federal judge in Washington, D.C. today when Soul of the South News continues. The punishment the former Illinois congressman now faces for misspending campaign funds. The dramatic pictures out of Alabama of a UPS cargo plane crash. A health care change that could affect substitute teachers nationwide. Project Runway helped make Kato Mamalu a household name, and her unique designs launched her to international fame. I'm Vicki Newton. Coming up on Soul of the South News, we turn the spotlight on the Liberian native during a visit to her U.S. design studio. You are watching Soul of the South News. Named as one of the top five designers to watch by New York Magazine, Corto Momolu says her time on Project Runway opened so many doors for her. Not only did it help her get her name out, she learned how to embrace color and diversity. In tonight's Spotlight Story, Soul of the South visits with the Liberian native here in her U.S. studio. Roy Coteau is grateful for the opportunity she's had to become an international designer, and she's hungry for more. She wants to use her growing fame to make her clothes more visible and prove that African designers can be successful. So this one, actually, I call the Mary dress. I actually designed it for Mary J. Blige. She was the inspiration behind it, and it's actually one of my signature cuts. Kato Mamalu is a name known all over the world. Her designs have been shown in Japan, Africa, Canada, South America, and all over the U.S. This Liberian native, who has called Arkansas home for the past 12 years, says fashion design wasn't her first career choice. Instead, she wanted to be a choreographer. I love to dance, and dance was my first love. But I had a goddess counselor that told me that I couldn't do it. And I didn't have the confidence at 14 to say, well, I'm going to do it anyway. So I knew I was going to do something creative because I've always been creative as long as I can remember. I still dance. I still do do dance. But um, design was kind of like my second choice. I, I kind of fell into. I just started designing clothes one day and my art teacher saw that. And she's the one that kind of nurtured that thought. You know, she helped me mature it and told me, you know, I think you're going into fashion design. After leaving Liberia in 1991 during a civil war, Coteau settled in Canada and eventually met her husband, a military man stationed in New York. We dated for like two years and he decided he was going to come home after he got out and I followed him. <laughs> that was 13 years ago. The two married, moved to Little Rock and had a daughter. This is actually one of my favorite um, pieces in the collection. As an independent artist, Coteau knew it was up to her to make a name for herself. In 2008, she auditioned for a reality television show called Project Runway. I actually had a show in Little Rock a week before auditioning, and I met Michael Knight, who was a contestant on season three. He looked at my work, and I asked him, you know, should I do it? You know, I was, what was it about? And he said, go for it, and I did. On the show, contestants compete with each other to create the best clothes while being limited on time, materials, and theme. Their designs are judged, and one or more designers is eliminated each week. And I went to New York with three models and three designs and gave it a shot, and I made it through all the way to the end. I finished second, first runner-up. On the season finale, Coteau presented her spring 2009 collection at Bryant Park during New York Fashion Week. You get to go and, you know, show your work to people who see you on the show, who you've inspired to do something that you're passionate about against all odds. You, you make it through, so it's like a story there. Besides just being a designer, you inspire people to dream. At 33, I went after my dream, and I made it a reality. 
After Coteau finished Project Runway, she was still in exile from Liberia, but she received a letter from a woman who wanted to start a sewing initiative there and asked Coteau to help lead the project. 23 years after leaving her home country, she returned to teach women how to use their craft to make money. Where I'm from, if you're a designer, you're a man. The men tailor clothes. Women don't do that. You do that for like your kids as a hobby. So for me to go and break that whole way of life and say, hey, I'm doing it. I'm a Liberian woman and I went through the war and I survived it and you can too. It was amazing for me. Coteau also got to put on a fashion show at City Hall while she was there. But what made it so special was that for the first time, her dad was in the audience. It was a huge thing for me. I think to go back made it full circle, you know what I mean? That's where I found my love of art, and I never got to show like my family there who I became, the woman I turned into, and to go back and actually show, that was the highlight of my life. As for her designs, Coteau says she makes clothes for real women. But every day you have moms and, and wives and professionals who are just like me who want to be fashionable and don't care about the rules. She says her designs are very individual, colorful, and unique. She describes them as fashionable, but comfortable. And they just want to stand out. They want people whispering about them at a party, but for a good reason, because you just look that fabulous. And I think that in itself gets me up every morning and brings me to the studio to do it all over again. When it comes to deciding on designs for a show, she says it is not uncommon for her to stare at the fabric for hours. And then I decide what I want to make out of them. And then sometimes I'll just say, you know what, it's not coming. I'm just going to drape. I'm going to let the fabric do what it's supposed to do, and it'll just come out of nowhere. Once I get the first piece done, it kind of interprets what the next pieces would be. If I don't have a clear view at the beginning, that's kind of how I go about it. I don't really take too much things too serious, you know? It's just, it's not enough to be stressed out about. It's just not that serious. <laughs> Coteau says anytime designers put their own creations in the public eye, they're opening themselves up to criticism for those in the fashion industry. There's always a doubt that you're not going to be successful. You're either in or you're out, and it's like one day you're the fashion darling and the next day they're on to the next new thing. So I think when you want to be a designer or anything creative for that matter, you have to really find the people that love what you do. And those people are going to stick by you. She knew moving to Arkansas instead of big fashion cities like LA or New York could potentially do more harm than good for her career. I think over time, Arkansas gave me that, that strength that I needed to really take criticism, the strength I needed to really like combat the naysayers, when you have people that support you just because you rep for where you're from, that's enough. Coteau says once you're a part of society, you should give back. She was able to go to design school thanks to a friend who paid her entire way. It was kindness like that that taught her to pay it forward. I give back to so many people, students coming here all the time or other designers, and I'm constantly giving something that, you know, was given to me. She enjoys helping up and coming fashion designers hone their craft while she also works to perfect her own. I think in five years, I really want to be established as a brand. Um, I'm kind of restructuring right now to figure out what exactly I want my brand to say, what exactly I want it to be. And I'm breaking that box. I'm getting out of that fashion box. It has to be this way or this way. I'm actually changing things to fit what suits me and my lifestyle and what's going to be best for me and my family and my life. You're just going to go like that, OK? <laughs> I've earned my spot here and I'm not moving. For Soul of the South News, I'm Vicki Newton. And one of the most recent designs she created was this gown for Miss Universe 2011. Layla Lopez wore this custom strapless mermaid style yellow gown during the 2012 pageant as her title reign came to an end. Up next on Soul of the South News. Dozens dead following violent clashes in Egypt. A controversial decision appears to be reversed, allowing a Georgia teen to be placed on a transplant donor list. And encouraging kids to move with the help of some of your favorite singers. Soul of the South News. This is Hope. Top of your news digest tonight, towering flames and billowing smoke from the crash of a UPS cargo plane this morning in Birmingham, Alabama. The pilot was approaching the airport when it crashed. The tower said no distress calls were made from the plane. The pilot and co-pilot were killed in the crash. Flight 1354 was coming from Louisville, Kentucky to Birmingham. The NTSB is on the ground to try to determine the cause. 
A month-long state of emergency is now in effect in Egypt as anti-government protesters continue to clash with Egyptian security forces. And a curfew is now in effect. Riot police used tear gas to disperse supporters of ousted President Mohamed Morsi. Nearly 235 people have been killed, but that's not stopping them from protesting his removal from office. We don't want to go anywhere. We don't want to get go anywhere. We are here until we have our goals, our, our opinion. We selected the president. Our president must come back. This is it. We, we are not coming home. We are trying to, to, to save ourselves, okay, or we will die. We, we are making anything which will save our lives, but we will not run away. We just, we are trying to barricade, to, 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 to save our lives. That's all. The United States is condemning the killing of the protesters and is opposing the state of emergency. The leader of the Islamic Nigerian terrorist group Boko Haram has issued a threat against the United States. The group is believed responsible for the deadly attacks across northern Nigeria. In this video, the man boasts that Nigerian government has been unable to stop them and it's time to branch out to bigger targets. Our strength and firepower is bigger than that of Nigeria. Nigeria is no longer a big deal to us. As far as we're concerned, we will now comfortably confront the United States of America. This message was released around the same time that 44 Muslim worshippers were massacred in a mosque. The terrorist group wants to overthrow the Nigerian government and replace it with Sharia law. For more than 20 years, Doctors Without Borders have been giving medical help to Somalia, but no more. It's leaving because of frequent attacks on its staff and facilities. The aid group, which has been in the African nation since 1991, says more than two dozen of its staff have been killed and dozens of its ambulances and medical facilities have been attacked. At one point, Doctors Without Borders had a staff of 1,500 providing medical help to Somalia. Disgraced former Congressman Jesse Jackson Jr. is going to prison for 30 months after being sentenced for campaign fraud. I still believe in the power of forgiveness. I believe in the power of redemption. Today I manned up and tried to accept responsibility for the errors of my ways. A weeping Jackson apologized to the court, the American people, and his parents. The 48-year-old pled guilty in February to misusing about $750,000 in campaign funds to buy luxury items. His wife Sandy, a former Chicago City Council member, was sentenced to one year for falsifying tax returns that failed to report the campaign money as income. South African athlete and double amputee Oscar Pistorius will be back in a South African courtroom on Monday. He's charged with premeditated murder and the death of his girlfriend, 29-year-old Riva Stemkamp. Pistorius admits to shooting her in his home on Valentine's Day, saying he mistook her for a home invader. An accidental detonation may have caused an explosion and deadly fire on an Indian submarine. 18 sailors were aboard the Russian-built sub docked at India's main naval base. Officials say hopes are fading that those inside the sub will be found alive. A former Indian senior naval official says the accident will be a big setback to the Indian naval fleet. We're now hearing from a Tennessee mother who a judge ordered to change her son's name. She wanted to call the boy Messiah, but the judge ordered a change to Martin saying in effect that Jesus was the only Messiah. Ironically, Jaleesa Martin and the child's father were in court on a totally unrelated matter. I actually went to court for child support, and me and the father, we couldn't agree on Messiah's last name. She just plainly came out and said, I'm going to change his first name because she didn't like it. The judge picked Martin Deshaun McCullough, giving the boy his father's last name. Jaleesa Martin says she will continue calling her son Messiah, and she has appealed the judge's order. Getting our kids to put the moves on. It's hard to believe that almost exactly one year ago, we launched a nationwide campaign called Let's Move to help solve the problem of childhood obesity. A 15-year-old Atlanta teen who was refused a spot on the heart transplant list is now on that list. Anthony Stokes' mother says doctors at first told her that he is, quote, currently not a transplant candidate due to having a history of noncompliance, unquote. 
Valencia Hamilton says she didn't know what that meant until she got this letter. They said that they don't have any evidence showing that he would take his medicine and he wouldn't have any follow-up care. But late yesterday, the hospital changed its mind and put the 15-year-old on the list. His mother says without a new heart, he only has six months to live. Substitute teachers and school support staff in several states may have their hours slashed to save their school districts money on health insurance. The Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, requires employers to offer health coverage to all full-time employees. Now, that's defined as someone who works an average of 30 or more hours a week, which is the case for many substitute teachers and support staff. One Indiana school district says that would have cost an additional $10 million. While cutting hours is not an across-the-board solution, the National School Board Association said many states and the school districts there are exploring reducing hours. First Lady Michelle Obama is turning to rap music to help drive her message home about healthy living. In this project, the First Lady's Let's Move campaign doesn't cause her to break a sweat, but it's the inspiration for an entire album of 19 songs. With healthy tunes like You Are What You Eat and Veggie Love, the songs were recorded by hit makers including Jordan Sparks, Ashante, and Dougie Fresh. The album will be available for free on the Partnership for a Healthier America website. And that's it for Soul of the South News tonight. I'm Roy Hobbs. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. Good night.